new places, new planeswalkers, new monsters, and new magic. Every set brings challenges for the creative team. What comes out of the Hell Vault? It's time to savour the flavour of Avacyn Restored. As of Avacyn Restored, you know that Sorin is back on his own plane, wondering what happened to the angel he created. Sorin created the angel as protector of the world, and he still doesn't know where she is, even after looking high and low. He has dealt with his vampire kin, who are none too fond of him for having created this angel, and now he's still on the hunt. Liliana is doing better on that hunt than Sorin is. We went after kind of a quiet, sedate horror, like a very grounded, lurking in the shadows sort of feel, which is, you know, that's even difficult for movies to get right. Like, try to think of the last movie that did not resort to orchestra hits and jumping cats to scare you, but actually created tension and dread and loathing, and now take away the ability to have any sort of moving narrative, <laughs> and you get that one shot per card. That is really what we went for. Liliana first goes to Ashmouth, contacts a demon, learns of a demon cult called the Skier's Dog, and furthermore learns that Volpeg is, in fact, the leader of the cult. Volpeg says, you know, it's funny, the information that you're looking for about where your precious demon is, that lies in the tomb of Micaeus. Liliana says, huh, interesting kills Volpeg, and strides into the Cathedral of Thraben. She uses necromancy to commit the ultimate heresy against a member of the Avicennian Church. She raises him from the dead. She puts undeath on him. Once Innistrad was established as the baseline, we turned the volume up a little with Dark Ascension and started doing subtle things like showing you things no longer lurking in the shadows. So she raises Micaeus from the dead, asks him the questions that she needs to know the answers to regarding the demon Grizzlebrand, gets those answers, and then dismisses Micaeus. Liliana knows that there's going to be a confrontation. She goes out to the cathedral yard, because what is it that Micaeus told her? Grizzlebrand is trapped inside this huge chunk of moon silver that sits in the cathedral yard called the Hell Vault. Liliana moves out to the Hell Vault with her zombie entourage and has a problem, because as you know, Black mages aren't so great at destroying artifacts. After a few moments, she realizes that she knows one spell that'll do it. The Cathars come pouring out. Thalia is leading them. Liliana issues a challenge to Thalia. She says, I can either destroy the Hell Vault, or I can destroy you and all your friends. Your choice. Your choice. So of course she chooses the Hell Vault. There's a blast of light, and there in the sky is the Archangel Avacyn. Avacyn Restored now is our final act, and basically we turn the light up. It's the same place, it's the same setting, but you have these moments of kind of light breaking through the clouds and more strong visuals on the sides of humanity. We knew that when it came to the third act of this story that the Archangel Avacyn would return to the world. But the question of exactly what the tone would be and what that would mean for the world was a little up for grabs. We had a debate internally about whether Avacyn would be restored and would vengefully return balance to the world. And then there was this other voice that said, we've had an awful lot of darkness already. Innistrad's already a dark place. In order to make this as impactful as possible, and in order to make it feel like the world is really transforming, we need to make this honest to God heroic. We need to make it heroic and infused with holiness and divinity, and the good guys get to win. To talk about the design of Avacyn, let's uh, rewind a little bit and talk about the design of Sorin. From the beginning of Innistrad, we knew that this angel would be important, and she's actually glimpsed a few times in the earlier set. We knew we needed to have her solved visually for that first set because we wanted to tease her. It was important to me that she have fairly direct visual reciprocity with Sorin, and so her costuming is modeled after his. She's kind of visually a little bit of a vanity plate to Sorin. It's not the odd couple, it's here is my lieutenant, and even the look of her reminds you who's really in charge. One of the big challenges with developing planeswalkers is that it's really difficult to tell an awesome story that involves too many characters. In order to really focus the story, we want to focus on the characters who matter most. However, there are some gameplay needs that need to be addressed. We had white, black, and green covered, so we knew that we wanted to do some stuff in red and blue. We had some character archetypes covered, our hunter and our femme fatale and our anti-hero. Those are all covered, so it has to be something that's not those. 
So you can see these parameters closing in. It's like, okay, it can't be this, and it can't be that, and it can't be that. So now that we've worked out the space for you to play in, go ahead and do something cool in that space. But what we ended up with is something a little experimental, but it's something that I'm happy with. So first up, we have the new Planeswalker character, Tamio. And Tamio certainly does not belong in Innistrad. You take one look at Tamio, and you're like, what is she doing here? Tamio is a moon sage. She's from the plane of Kamigawa. She is here to study the relationship between the moon of this plane, which is made of silver, and the plane itself. Tamio is interested in her own strange, detached way. And we'll see how that character unfolds going forward when she's, when she's in other contexts. One of the things that's really important for us, beyond just good character design that just has to be awesome and, you know, automatically resonant, is trying to vary the silhouettes to have these kind of different shapes so it's not just all so one note. And so Tybalt, honestly, when it boils down to it visually, I wanted a really thin, lean, lithe, Armani-dressed planeswalker. <laughs> That was, that was what we were going for. Tybalt's a fan of causing people pain. In fact, he's enough of a fan of causing people pain that he sort of takes it upon himself to divine the nature of a devil's essence and then custom makes magic that infuses the essence of a devil with that of his own. So he becomes this sort of devil-blooded human. He transforms himself into this half-human, half-devil. So when it comes to the lands of Avacyn Restored, we actually take extra effort to make the lands communicate the sense of world even more than the spells. And the reason why is because in magic games, lands are the only constant. You may or may not see any spell in the set, but the lands are always there in front of you. We actually spend more time than you might think trying to make sure that the lands communicate the flavor. The basic lands are the omnipresent element in every game, and we wanted to make sure that players understood the fundamental change in the world. The flavor of cards works on a fairly surface level, so sometimes we have to be a little sledgehammery about the flavor. In the case of the basic lands, these are the same lands as the ones from Innistrad, painted by the same illustrators, but now sunlit, renewed, and with this sense of lightness and hope infusing them, so that you can put one next to the other and say, oh, the world changed, I get it. It's just an ordinary office building. But what goes on inside is far from ordinary. In design, in development, and in creative, the teams here at Wizards of the Coast are working together to bring great new play experiences for our favorite game. Until next time on Inside R&D, this has been the story of Avacyn Restored. <laughs>